Hi! It's uh, been two months. I've been very busy with work. That's why I wasn't really able to talk about the books that I read last month. So I'll try to squeeze everything that I read in the past two months in one video. That means that I am going to not uh, be very detailed or not as detailed as I would like. I, I think I'll just leave the plot out. So I will just be telling you my thoughts, maybe like um, the rating that I gave, even though I'm not particularly the biggest fan of like the five star rating. I think that's very reductive. I'm not saying that we should come up with like... What's my cat doing? Okay, I'm not saying that we should come up with like a, a full like 16 box rubrics of where the book lies. Even though like, you know, if I was really really bored someday, I might just go ahead. Actually right, you know, if you think about it, people always give books like 3.5 stars, which makes it like a 7 out of 10. So hopefully someday, like the 10 star rating will be normalized. By the way, I made this myself. Yeah, I made it by hand. It took me like two days. Yeah, I made the top part in one evening and I made the bottom part in one evening. It's supposed to be like a butterfly crochet top kind of thing. So first off, in the month of September, I read the Poppy War trilogy. It is something that has been recommended to me by quite a few people. I went into it thinking that it was not going to be about war, so that's on me. But uh, the first part of the book threw me off because the understanding I got was that there was this protagonist who is a girl who's an orphan and she's supposed to be like really smart smart enough to get into a prestigious school and then over there she learns uh, warfare she learns she learns how to fight it just seems like those kind of like special elite school but 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 she has magic so she kind of has a mentor that helps her hone her magic so that was like the impression I got right that's what I thought and then it just combusted because the war started so everything that I thought this book was going to be about was truncated like unfortunately cut short and I feel like that in itself was probably intentional like um, the author wanted us to see exactly how disruptive war would be and then after that it is just an endless succession of uh, horrific sights I mean, the author said herself that she was writing loosely based on the rape of Nanking. So there really was a lot of um, torture and a lot of rape going on in the book. It's definitely not a children's fantasy series. It's very, very dark, very gory, very gruesome, very brutal. And I would hesitate to, to recommend this to like children. Yeah, so it's definitely not YA. I do not know why sometimes I see it on the YA shelf. Uh, I'm like, do you read the same book that I did? Do we have the same understanding of what YA is? Probably not, right? For the next three books, it's literally just a lot of um, and then what happened, and then what happened, and then what happened. Our protagonist, she kind of starts out as like a hero, but then slowly she goes towards what appears to be the idealistic villain type. And clearly, she she has her own villain origin story and she goes through many, many traumatic experiences that, that would turn anybody into a villain. And I guess that is also another message that under the correct circumstances, anybody can break and become a villain. And so out of all three books, the only character that I really liked was Kite. <laughs> I think like Kite is everybody's son. Yeah, I think like you can kind of already tell that for a book like this, there is absolutely no way it can have a happy ending because in war, there is no happy ending. I'm just going to spoil it for you. There's no happy ending. Don't have. Oh, I also read the novella that's supposed to be in between book two and book three, which is from the perspective of Nerja. Nerja, who is like a sort of like a frenemy. Sometimes they are enemies, then they become friends, then they become enemies, then they are also kind of friends. When you compare them with like the Hesperians, the Hesperians who who kind of remind me of Angmors, like Angmors, white Angmors who want to colonize uncivilized barbaric countries and then introduce their religion in order to save them from themselves. It just sounds a lot like uh, white Christians to me. And I'm very surprised that this book is so popular with white people because I'm like, you all realize that in this series, you guys are the 
biggest ultimate bad guys, right? Kudos to the author for getting away with that. I enjoyed it for a bit and then I realized that uh, it was just another thing to become horrified by. It's really not something you can read during meal times, but then microdosing it will just make you stressed and miserable for a longer period of time. So uh, I would recommend what I did, which is just to read it in one sitting as fast as possible. And then you process it afterwards. So that's uh, book one, two, three, plus four, the novella. Following the Poppy War trilogy, I felt that maybe I should read the author's uh, latest book, the one that just came out maybe a month ago. It's Babel. Yeah, this book was trending everywhere. On TikTok, on Twitter. To my knowledge, everybody outside of Singapore was reading Babel. I think like Singaporeans, we, we have our own like sort of hype books, uh, which I am very out of touch with because I was honestly not online a lot during that period of time. So I decided to just read what I saw outside of Instagram. Everybody was reading Babel internationally, so I was like, okay, I'll read Babel too. I had kind of high expectations for this book because I read Yellow Face before by RF Kuang as well. I get why it is internationally popular. It does touch on things like language, you know, the power of language, uh, power of translation itself. It also does talk a lot about colonialism, a little bit of feminism, also it talks about sort of internalized racism, things like that. But personally for me, I guess I was a little bit put off by the romanticizing of Oxford. Like maybe it's because uh, I grew up in this city island. I have been to Cambridge but for like a two week program but I wouldn't say that it was like the best time of my life and I wouldn't say that I want to live in that kind of place uh, forever. I, I understand why people do, though it is uh, traditionally beautiful. Every time we think about academia, the kind of image we get is always those kind of like very old colonial brick buildings and like cobblestone streets and like basically like potter core kind of things. But uh, for me, like it's never really held uh, that big of an appeal. The, the parts where they were talking a lot about the architecture of Oxford and uh, how beautiful it is, I was like, uh, skip. Yeah, it just didn't really appeal to me. I was, I was more interested in the story rather than the setting. It's an alternate history, dark academia kind of novel where the author imagines that there is a tower in the middle of Oxford called Babel and over there they deal with translation. And why translation? Because the act of translating something creates energy which uh, is magic fuel, of course, which then makes technology possible. So instead of like a, a electronic computer, internet AI based kind of technological advancement, the development and the advancements are made possible through language based magic. I don't really know how to summarize it without completely giving it away. Because I think you should try to read this book on your own without me spoiling it for you, without spoiling it yourself by reading things online. Go and read it. The issue then of who owns what language and who wields what language and for what purposes and who benefits from the exploitation of foreign languages as such is an issue that is then explored because in line with her other books, the author does show that, for lack of a better way of saying it, uh, it is white people. <laughs> yeah, she is specifically talking about imperialism and how it takes advantage of other cultures and how it sort of appropriates what by right belongs to other cultures and turns it into a kind of like profit-making machine for the center. The center being Oxford. So when I read it, I was like thinking that this author was definitely going to get many haters. But I guess it's a good thing then that she is kind of already wildly popular with a very strong loyal band of followers. But it also felt very similar in terms of direction to her book Yellow Face, which I liked even more. Because I felt that in Yellow Face, she dared to say the things that she only implied in Babel. There are already people hating on her for writing Yellow Face. I think that it takes a lot of uh, bravery to do something like that. You don't have to agree with the message or its execution, but I think that, not that I don't, uh, I do, okay? Yeah, but you do need to sort of give credit to 
uh, her balls lah. She got balls. I'm trying to keep the review short. So if you want to read the review, you just go to like Goodreads and you can read my review there. Or you can read other people's reviews there. There's so many reviews out there already. The next book I read is the second book in the Six Crimson Cranes duology. In my head, I was thinking it was going to be a trilogy. And then I finished reading this book and I was like, they wrapped it up really nicely. What's going to happen in the next book? And then I googled it and it turns out there is no next book. It's just two books. I was like, huh? You mean there's only two books to this? She gets her happy ending and that's it. Anyway, um, maybe it's like the second book curse or something. But I felt like the first book was a bit better. The second book is basically her trying to fulfill her promise to her stepmother. You know, the one that she made before her stepmother passed away. It felt a lot like very disjointed fight scenes with different magical creatures. And there wasn't as much emotional resonance with the reader as there was in the first book. Maybe it's just the second book curse. Like, you know, the first book was so good that the second book just cannot live up to it. Uh, this is definitely YA because uh, nobody has sex. Yeah, the most they have is like one kiss. It's like a like a, like a, like a three star kind of read. It's something that you will read because you want to know how it ends, but it's not like super compelling. Next book is this book that's been on my radar for a while, The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea. I didn't really know much about the Korean myth that this was based on, but I felt that it had a very interesting sort of premise. The idea is that there's the dragon and then on a regular basis, the village like needs to like sacrifice a young <laughs> virgin to the dragon. Supposedly, this will uh, stop the bad weather and allow them to have a bountiful harvest. You know, it's a very like typical kind of premise. But then uh, as I was reading it, I got very strong spirited away vibes from it. There is this girl, so her brother risks it all and tries to like stop the dragon from taking his beloved. And then this protagonist who is trying her best to be a good sister, she's like, take me instead, I volunteer as tribute. She gets sucked into the ocean, she kind of shows up and then her soul is taken from her and then she finds out that she has like one month to fix things, if not she is going to remain a spirit forever and then after that she finds out that uh, the village was like really upset and afraid still so they threw in the girl that she was trying to save anyway i guess the whole point of this is the romance but the romance also struck me as a little bit um insincere like you're telling me you spent two days with this guy and you fall in love with him I, I am ready to suspend my my disbelief for things like dragons and magic but like falling in love is in two days is it's just not something that i can uh easily accept but i guess like you know she was on a timeline which is one month only so okay law she fall in love in two days and then uh it's the power of love that manages to save them all in the end yeah, so you can kind of tell that this is a very YA book. So I gave it a 3 stars. <laughs> okay, next book is also YA. I'm not intentionally reading YA. I am reading books that I have heard were good. And just because like a book has children as its main characters doesn't mean that it's juvenile or childish. Like in the case of this book, Nura and the Immortal Palace, I felt that the themes were actually not for children. Like I was reading it and I was like, um, it's kind of Marxist, isn't it? Because over here, this book is criticizing child labor, it's criticizing the exploitation of the poorer communities, hoarding of wealth and wages, the creation of a ruling class and working class, and I'm like, is this a children's book? Am I reading a children's book? It, it, it seems a bit um, chim to be a children's book, even though cognitively I can understand that I am reading a children's book, you know, it's like an adventure novel. It's a bit like a Spirited Away also, but a Muslim. It reminded me very much of like Harun and the Sea of Stories, in which you have a, a child who uh, ends up in the, in the magical realm and then they encounter like the jinns and then they encounter like other spirits. And in this book, the character, Nura, she encounters her own doppelganger. Nura is one of those child laborers. She works in the mines. Uh, her father passed away working in the mines. Yeah. And then now her mother is a single mother working very hard and uh, they have no money. So Nura has no choice but to go work in the mines. She mines for this thing called like Mika. 
but then um, they get paid kind of peanuts for it and it is the, the bosses who get to like keep the Mika. It just reads a lot like child exploitation to me. One day, an accident happens, uh, she thought she died. No, she actually ended up in the gin realm. She ends up being indentured again in a hotel. She ends up being one of the invisible labourers who keeps the super swanky fancy hotel going. And all because the boss wants to make money. Surprisingly, I like really <laughs> enjoyed this book. Even though I was very disturbed by the child labour practices in it. In the afterword, the author also makes it very clear uh, her purpose in writing a book like this, which is to sort of criticize these existing practices. I felt that it was very well done. I would let children read this. I would let my children read this, just so they know what is right and what is wrong. This is a four-star book for me. Uh, where are we now? Uh, we have uh, we have five more books to go. Okay, so five more books. Count down now. And the fifth last book from here is uh, Brown is Redacted. Hang on, actually I got the book. Yeah. I really, I really took it seriously. I studied it because I felt like I felt like it was the least I could do. Brown is redacted. Is it's a collection. It's an anthology of different kinds of forms. So, for example, yeah. So sometimes you have an essay like that. Sometimes you have a play like that. Sometimes, sometimes you get a poem like that, and it's just very uh, diverse. Uh, diverse not just in terms of form, but also in terms of voice. The word brown is not actually referring to any particular race or religion. In fact, like brown is more of like a position in society, especially in Singaporean society. So in this book, the writers related the kind of problems, the kind of challenges that they face. One of the issues that was explored was intersectionality. So it's not just about being brown. What if you are brown and queer? What if you are brown and disabled? How then uh, is your marginalization different? It's not necessary for a book like this to offer solutions because the reality is that there, there are no clear-cut solutions to this. And in fact, I don't think like most people are ready to implement solutions yet. They just don't care enough yet. It's important enough for these stories to exist as they are, as proof, as a record, without trying to have any kind of like prescriptive approach to the issues brought up. Um, it is never comfortable to read about discrimination or oppression. Like, nobody reads it and goes, wow, this brings so much joy to my life. No one thinks like that, right? But I think that, you know, as a person existing on Earth, benefiting a lot from the position in society that I was born into, we kind of do have a responsibility to kind of educate ourselves and to make ourselves aware of how things are different for other people and to really just read with an open mind from a place of seeking to understand others a bit better. Maybe never fully because you can never understand something fully unless it is your experience itself. But I think like we can always try to do our part. Listen to the people who have something to say. That is my opinion. It's definitely a heavy read. For a book like this, giving it like a, a star rating is kind of pointless because the, the stars given do not reflect the necessity or do not reflect the kind of weight behind a book like this. Oh yeah, uh, I got it as an advanced reading copy from Ethos Books. So if you want to order it, you can order it from Ethos Books. Okay, next book. Kai Ke Yi. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I, I strongly suspect that I am not. If you are familiar with Hindu beliefs, which you know not a lot of people are, even in Singapore, this book is based on their religious text, the Ramayana. And if you know a little bit about the Ramayana, you will know that there is this like evil stepmother character who sort of like banishes the main character, Rama. Uh, to live in a ulu -S forest for a while because she was jealous of him and she wanted to make sure her own son would ascend the throne or this is like the the sort of like a law behind it so what this book does is that it takes that myth i hesitate to say it because i saw people slamming people for calling it a myth it is a myth okay it's a myth the same way the bible is a myth 
it's a myth in the sense that it has taken on mythic proportions, you know? It has become a, a central story to, to many people. It's the core of like some people's identities, which is why I call it a myth. I don't call it something a myth to sort of denigrate it. I call it a myth to show how culturally important it is to some people. The author who grew up in this religion, she decides to rewrite that portion of the myth and turn the stepmother into the protagonist instead. So exactly what could motivate her to do something like that? She tries to reimagine uh, a childhood for this woman, imagine like, you know, the circumstances of her marriage, uh, the circumstances of her producing children, and she also kind of creates like, a magic system within her book. I first heard of this book when I saw people complaining about it. I saw like somebody, I won't say who, uh, talk about how Oh, this book is not true to the Ramayana and it is a horrible and a unqualified retelling, something like that. After that, there was the whole Sarah Underwood scandal. Yeah, the interview is like missing now, but if you scour the internet, you can still find some of it. Basically, this white author who's like a STEM major or something, she decides to write a feminist retelling and then she said in an interview that she never read the Odyssey even though her book is based on the Odyssey. And then a lot of people were defending her. And then there are a lot of people coming out to ask these defenders, why is it that you have such low standards for white writers, whereas uh, POC writers are held to such uh, impossibly high standards at all times. And Kai Kei was one of those books that was uh, brought out as an example of how the author sort of unfairly faced a lot of criticism for the book that she wrote, even though she was literally writing about something from her own culture. They were sort of like nitpicking. So I read it because I was really capable. So I, I went to read all the tea about this book first before I went to actually read the book. And then I read the book and I was like, it's a good book. I don't understand why people are nitpicking it. It's her own religion, is it not? I mean, are you going to go to John Milton and be like, uh, how dare you write Bible fan fiction that makes the devil look sexy? It's his religion, right? Like, if you're so touchy about these kind of like religious retellings, then don't read law. That's just my opinion. Like, going back to the book itself, like separate from the super messy discourse, I felt that it was a very good read. I gave it like a clear 4 stars. It's like a 4.5 star for me because it really made you empathize with the stepmother character. It shows that even though she did make some decisions that did not make her the most popular person, it's not like there were no consequences for her. It's not like she was having the best time in her life doing it. Like she made these decisions because she had no other choice. I think like this idea of women not having any choices is also uh, a recurrent theme throughout her book where it shows that because of the patriarchal expectations themselves, uh, women were basically occupying a, a lower position in society. This is also one of the things that was brought up in the discourse. They were saying like, you make our religion sound bad because you, you make it sound like we all oppress women. I'm like, okay. Traditionally, can you show me a religion that does not position women as uh, inferior to men? Don't have what, right? So like, I like, chill, bro. She's not making the religion sound bad. Like, we are already aware that there are these expectations to begin with. Um, as far as retellings go, I felt that this was very close to the level of like, Children of Tracasta and even like Miller's Circe. I felt that uh, the author did uh, a really good job. Okay, the next book. You made a fool of death with your beauty. This book was like a hot novel or something like that. I kept seeing people talk about it. I kept hearing about how this author is so versatile and uh, she has written so many different kinds of books before and how how well she wrote like her first romance novel. So I went in with like expectations that were sky high. Maybe that was my downfall because I honestly, I could not get into it. I was just so confused by the plot. Long story short, it's about this woman who was widowed shortly after getting married and then she's like very heartbroken because you know, uh, he died in a car accident and then he died and she didn't die and she was still beautiful and stuff like that. And five years later, she's like, I need to get over him. So she goes to a party and then she like has sex with a guy in the toilet. It fizzles out and then she decides to sort of date his friend and then this friend of his brings her overseas back to his island to enter an art show and she agrees and then she goes there. 
and then she falls in love with this second guy's dad <laughs> yeah and i was like oh my god there's like a 19 year age gap between y'all i am not like a anti-age gap kind of person but like 19 years is it's very big you know and okay i get that it's it's not like purely like a, a sexual attraction between them but that is because they both uh, have gone through very traumatic experiences before but yeah i just could not get into this book i tried my best i really tried my best maybe i'm not like i'm not angmore enough it's like a very angmore story i don't know how to tell you this but it is so the one thing i would give this book is that it's very diverse like basically everybody in this book is queer except one guy second last book out of the blue by jason june the premise of this book is uh, you have a non-binary mer person who needs to complete like a trial on land for one month where they do a good deed then they can go back to where they came from. This mer person was very unwilling to do it because they felt that what is the point? I don't want to be a human. I hate human beings. All they do is pollute the oceans and destroy the earth. So they didn't really have a very positive view of human beings to begin with. Uh, they come on land and then they encounter this person who is a competitive swimmer. He recently just got dumped by his boyfriend who uh, decided to go and date the hottest guy in school instead. So he was very heartbroken. Uh, the mer person is like, I will help you get your boyfriend back and this will be my good deed. So uh, they start fake dating and then obviously this becomes a a real dating because they really have feelings for each other as much as this is definitely a queer romance novel that's also YA I would say that there is also equal emphasis on personal development it wasn't just all about these two gay people falling in love that wasn't the only thing it was about them also developing their characters figuring out exactly what it is that they want in life prioritizing that over just the romance I felt that that was a very nice an unexpectedly mature take it's a good book the last book that i read in the past two months is book 13 yeah yeah book 13 uh, greedy by jen winston this is um non-fiction i saw quite a few positive reviews about it so i read it and then it turns out to be some kind of like memoir but the memoir portions are the launching pads for discussions on what it means to identify as queer. Throughout the book, the author acknowledges her own white privilege. She acknowledges she's white, feminine presenting, and on top of that, she's also conventionally attractive, meaning like, you know, skinny. She understands that the experience that she has as a bisexual woman is very different from the experiences of people who are more marginalized. She says that bisexuality can be used as a kind of political lens through which we really examine why is it that we think certain things are right or wrong or unacceptable or shameful and why we feel guilt for some things that perhaps we shouldn't feel guilt for. Well, the one thing that really threw me off about this book was how much uh, sex there was. I guess like she goes by the identity of a sex writer. So this is definitely like a kind of like R21 book, not for children. It's her own experiences she's writing about. Lah. So uh, I guess it's really up to her. I was mostly interested in the portions that came after the sexual encounter. She used the encounter to reflect on her grappling with her sexuality and her bisexuality because it took her like 30 years to come to terms with it. I would say that she deserves credit for not trying to sugarcoat how we view her. She does not come off as the best person based on the memoir which is very brave right? Like it's your memoir, you've got the opportunity to control the narrative, you can make it sound like you are a paragon of virtue but she does not do that she shows that she's actually like really flawed sometimes that she really fucks up big time sometimes and i think there is this overall message that there is no such thing as like the perfect queer person and you shouldn't need to be perfect to identify as queer yep okay so i'm done that was 13 books in November, I am planning to read a little bit more, but at the same time, I need to start like 
packing my things because I'm moving house. I still need to go to work. So it really depends on how tired I feel afterwards. Also, I'm working on my Animal Crossing island. I have plans. My goal is to, to finish reorganizing everything on my island by December. So that's all. See you in a month's time. Bye bye.